It all sounds good. And in this world of just utter density, um, concerns, worries, anxieties, sorrows, all of these things that we carry from past, all these things we project into the future are like clouds that cloud this bright, open, luminous sky of mind. And so this untangling can be a huge challenge. And for this reason, in uh, Tantric Buddhism, what we call Vajrayana tradition, in the yoga tradition, um, there is this priority to kind of clear, to clear the patterns, the density, the patterning of our own kind of projections, our own reactions, our emotions, all of the things that cloud this open sky mind. And uh, one of the ways that that is done is, as we mentioned briefly last week, is by attuning ourselves, by refining our attention enough to see what is actually there in our subtle space. So we talked, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks about the three main bodies that we find in Buddhism, the Nirmanakaya, the form body, this physical form that we inhabit. Um, that's very practical and that allows us to do things and act in the world. Yeah? The Sambhogakaya, this body of energy that we are talking about today, this body of experience, of sensory input, of vibration, of movement, of constant change, of ultimately of luminosity. And Dharmakaya, the body of wisdom, the body of truth, if you will, the body that uh, is largely uh, not embodied, <laughs> but it is that body of uh, consciousness that pervades all things. So. so we're here kind of working here with the second body as a skillful means, as a way to kind of uncover or shine up the mirror so that the third body of Dharmakaya, of wisdom, the wisdom body, the body of truth, the body revealed through the teachings of mindfulness and, and uh, Dharma uh, becomes almost more intuitive to us. It becomes almost more accessible and it just feels right when we know it, yeah. <clears throat> So in the tradition, I'm going to show you a couple of diagrams. The first one I have to apologize for. It is my extremely rudimentary uh, sort of drawing. Let's see where do I have that here? Okay, so just bear with me here. The zoom is slow. There it is. I call this guy Chakra Man. <laughs> this gives you sort of a, an idea of what we're going to be doing this evening. What is a chakra? What is a chakra? A wheel. A wheel, literally meaning wheel. A wheel of energy that spirals, turns, spins, if you will. There is an amazing book written by Dr. Singh Khalsa, who is a uh, surgeon and a medical doctor, as well as a Sikh tantric uh, practitioner called a Meditation as Medicine, where this man who has been so profoundly educated, uh, both in the yogic system as well as traditional medicine, has done an amazing job. It's a highly technical book, but he corresponds these energy systems, the uh, nadis or the energy channels in the body with the nervous system and the organ system of organs and so on. It's utterly brilliant in my view, um, as well as uh, words, chants, or a syllable for each organ system. It's high, I think it's very sophisticated. It's been out for a while, this text, um, this book. Anyway, if you're interested in this, in that kind of thing, you might you might explore that. So for our purposes though, um, we're looking at 
what are called the seven seven primary chakras in the body in the subtle physiology rather and <clears throat> there are of course more there are thought to be many more chakras than these seven the hands have supposedly energy centers we can feel sometimes heat sort of opening closing in the hands as well as the bottom of the feet um, there are supposedly chakras beyond the physical body and smaller ones that exist elsewhere we're really going to focus on these seven primary uh, centers of energy here and the first one down the muladhara which is at the very base of the spine it <clears throat> these things are like little funnels they're like little funnels that where the, the small end is attached right into the central channel that runs from the crown all the way to the base of the spine just as we did last week when we did uh, the spinal breathing and um, <clears throat> this first one is where this sort of vitality in sanskrit there's a term ojas ojas means sort of the vital energy of creativity that arises from um, from this ch chakra actually releases it into the rest of the body here at the base of the spine this is actually down right at the perineum called it's also called the root chakra root chakra if you've ever heard this term and this is that aspect of the psychophysiological characteristic here is one of fear is one of stability well-being or fear material well-being scarcity issues abundance these are all things that are just sort of these primal um kind of limbic system issues, the fear of death, um, confidence in being safe and secure. This is all part of this root. Um, and in Buddhism, you have each of these chakras are associated with an element, and they are as well in yoga. In Buddhism, though, this first one naturally is associated with the earth element. I'm going to show you another image here as well bring this up this is probably a better <laughs> rendition here i'm going to see if i can put these side by side each one has a color each one has is associated with um, a color they tend to be different in buddhism than they are in yoga so this here uh, this image is actually the yoga system the colors that you find in yoga and ultimately when we i get asked this actually pretty regularly why are the colors different why would that be the case uh and actually it's not that the uh colors are different per se but the um the way that we perceive these colors is is sort of non-ordinary yeah these are not literal colors on a palette but they are in fact um There we go. We've got them side by side. They are, in fact, um, more sort of uh, what we might call psychic colors. They appear differently to different people. Um, and I've never worried too much about getting the colors right. Sometimes our entire sort of inner space can vibrate red or it can vibrate um, purple and so on. And if you practice this, it's really kind of interesting when you start meditating on these chakras. Um, you can actually look at people, and if you've practiced enough, you can kind of see what color are they resonating at right now. It does take practice, so if you if you find this difficult, don't worry about it. Um, I try to stay out of other people's space anyway, um, but every once in a while something appears, and uh, and you can kind of see. Now that doesn't tell me a whole lot because these are not universal colors that are common to everyone but along with the color comes a sense a sense that each person might have um, about what really is the heart of the matter in that color so this is why i don't worry too much about the literality of the colors um just looking at the chart oh okay marie says i don't see them side by side are are we seeing them okay they're not side by side okay thank you for letting me know so what i'm going to do let's try sharing again 
Interesting. Each doc, each uh, of these documents is sort of a separate share. So that's why. All right. Um, that's okay. We'll go to this one. So <clears throat> the second chakra that you find here is just below the navel. This sort of conical or cone shaped center of energy uh, where the small end is, is fixed itself into the central channel and the large end is expanding out beyond the limits of the physical body. Interestingly, these are thought to also be emanating from the back of us, not just the front. And often when we practice these things, we will only sort of practice from the sort of the front. But um, the energy in these chakras actually cycles clockwise. And so as we meditate on this, um, you may have a sense that there is very slow rotation, or you may have a sense that there's rotation the other direction, which has happened to me occasionally. And usually that means I'm pulling in energy, that something is coming in, especially for empaths, people who are very empathetic. Uh, the second chakra is the center of, um, of empathy, of feeling feelings for others. Uh, it's also... Uh, it's also a representative, representative of passion and creativity as well as sexual energy. So we find that here in this chakra as well. Uh, the, th the third chakra here at the navel, just above the navel, is um, in the solar plexus associated with the sun, Surya the Sanskrit term for Surya, sun, that <clears throat> this is largely the energy center, the power center of the body. It actually is uh, thought to be much larger than the others. And that third chakra, right where the breastbone comes together, a little bit lower, just above the navel, is um, also where <clears throat> sort of power, what we call personal power, or the power of our own capacity, confidence, so uh, these are the psychophysiology characteristics associated here with this chakra as well. Um, if somebody has said something hurtful to you, you may feel it here in the third chakra. You'll feel this kind of um, butterfly feeling or kind of a contraction. Often we hold a lot of issues here and our vitality is severely diminished when, uh, when this happens. So this is a good one to pay attention to when we practice. And then uh, the fourth, the green one here at, at the heart. Um, this is the heart, otherwise known as the heart chakra or the anahata. Anahata is the Sanskrit word for this, the gateway to heaven. Uh, because consciousness itself is seen to arise here from the heart, not from the brain. Um, the element here is the air element. The, the third chakra we just talked about was the fire element seem to be the fire element. And the second one I forgot to mention is that of water. So, um, so here in the heart chakra, this aspect of emotions, of uh, strong emotions, as well as love, compassion, the reason it's called the gateway to heaven is that it is actually that, that aspect within the subtle body where our consciousness can begin to ascend, awareness attunes itself to higher states. <clears throat> then we move up here to um, this light blue energy center at the base of the throat, otherwise known as the throat chakra sometimes. This element is ether, or <clears throat> what might be called sort of the refinement of space, so it's subtler than air. Um, and this is the chakra that really deals with communication as well as uh, openness and the expression of truth, of wisdom, of your own personal needs, things like that. So when we do the Vajra, the three Vajras, this is the second of the three Vajras. The heart is the third. Um, we're, we're chanting the syllable ah in the Buddhist tradition here. This is about openness, about 
profound openness and truth and confidence in expression. So, and then the center of the forehead, the sixth chakra, this sort of uh, indigo color here. Um, this is not so much associated with an element, but it is seen to be the seat of consciousness. So it's very, very subtle, very refined, representing a refinement of consciousness itself. And so here, this is very much attuned to mind. And this is what we call the lunar plexus, whereas the solar plexus is sort of the fire element in the third chakra and that aspect of brightness and warmth that runs through the central channel. Here we have the lunar plexus, which is uh, largely one of calm. It's, uh, whereas Surya, meaning sun, is the solar plexus here. Chandra, the word Chandra, is Sanskrit for moon. And um, it involves the region of the cerebellum, the brain, and is thought to cool the heat. So this is one of the wholesome properties of this lunar plexus, is it has a cooling aspect to it, and it represents mind and consciousness. This is according to Iyengar the great yogi, um, yogic master, yoga teacher, BKS Iyengar. And then finally here at the very top in the crown, what's called the thousand petaled lotus. So this diagram almost makes it look like the chakra is pointing towards you, but in fact, it's point, pointing upwards. So the small end of this cone is sort of down right in the center that central channel goes right up and feeds, if you will, or opens out into the crown chakra here. And this is the, uh, the energy center that opens us, that receives the presence of all that is beyond us, including the divine, whatever that means to us. It may be the light of heaven, God, divine, or just simply the energy of all things. Yeah profound love. And so <clears throat> we can experience the luminosity, the bliss, the radiance through the entire body when all of these centers are open. And part of the meditation we're going to do is to go through and just see what we're feeling in each of these energy centers, feeling them, seeing if we can simply lightly touch them with the breath and have a sense of openness there and see what's there. Um, in Buddhism, the Buddhist traditions, often these are visualized as lotus, whatever the plural of the word lotus is. <laughs> these are lotuses or loti or lotus. Um, and um, often they are also affiliated with um, divine beings. In some of the, the tantric traditions, there will be a, a being, a deity that inhabits each of these energy centers and a consort. So some practices will actually meditate on each energy center as being a union of that deity, of that being, and their consort in a non-dual way, that the male principle and female principle are unified within that, that being, so that there is balance in each of these chakras. So... Yeah, so anyway, I think this is <clears throat> where we can begin, actually, with the practice. And again, what is the purpose of this? I think, as we talk about in, uh, in Buddhist tradition, motivation matters. What is our motivation for doing this? Our motivation, of course, is to alleviate suffering. It's also to be of benefit, to sort of be in the world in a way that makes the world better, that alleviates the suffering of others, that sees our well-being and our balance as really impacting our environment in a wholesome way. So we're not just doing this for ourselves to feel better, to have you know, enlightened experiences, but also to be a model to be of benefit in the world. And so our... Uh, aspiration, our motivation matters here. 
So if you ever feel like you're just not really sure, why am I doing this? Or how realistic is it to do this? This just feels like it's imagination and fantasy. Um, just have the aspiration, come back to your deepest motivation for your practice. You can, after all, feel it within the center of your own heart. That if you reap the benefit, if you feel change from this practice, you'll see, wow, this really is a powerful way to um, either practice or to enter into a deeper meditative state. So.